Hey everyone, welcome back to Rooted, where we become more rooted in our faith and growing in community. We are still in the midst of our State of the Union series, and it's week three this week, and I have a few guests with me this week. I'm Sarah, and I've got Pastor Mark with us. And I also, every week, we do this together. (laughs) And I have Pastor Angel with us as well to discuss this sermon all about rejection, um, returning from rejection. So, um, yeah. How's everybody doing? How are you feeling today? Feeling tired. Feeling tired. Keep drinking that coffee, bro. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's actually the Emmanuel Blend. Oh, Cold brew. You can get it at the e-store. There you go. Or the cafe. I would love to say I'm tired because I stayed up last night watching the <laughs> Cowboys beat the Steelers, but I didn't. No. So uh, I, that's not an excuse for me. I had to throw that Weather in there because Angel is a Steelers fan. Yes. Yeah. So I had to throw that. Yes. Uh, I there had to throw go. that jab in there. And that quick. is why I'm tired because I actually, oh, on the flip up. side, did stay up yes. to watch my Steelers yes. crumble. Yeah. He crumble. felt rejected. I did. Rejected. So, by Justin Fields <laughs> specifically. Yes. yes. But it's well, all right. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's good. I'm tired today too, but we're we glad we're so glad we could be encouraging to everybody listening to this podcast. Yes, yes. Yeah, we're tired. Yes. If you're tired, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. A- yes, it's a Monday. <laughs> it feels like a Monday to us recording to us. this. It's recording, a Monday. yes. To those watching, it probably won't be a Monday. No, it will not be a Monday. Yeah. <laughs> so this week, week three, State of the Union, which has been all about relationships and um, our union with each other. And um, you hit rejection head on this week with the life of David. And I wonder if people really knew the amount of times that David felt rejection just in the passage of scripture that you covered um, this week, uh, just from being rejected first by not even being considered to possibly be um, the next king or anointed as the next king when right. Samuel came to the house of Jesse. And then we see a, him rejected again by his brother when he comes to the battlefield to serve right. his brothers, to bring food, to check on them, and was rejected there. And um, then rejected by Saul. We saw three cases where David was rejected. So I just thought we'd start off the conversation um, today about a time, maybe share a time when you have felt rejected, because the bottom line is we're all going to be rejected by someone at some point in our lives. Hmm. Wow, you are going for yeah. it I'm going today. for it. I know. I didn't start hey, with consignment shops or any <laughs> of your moly. introduction like today. We're just, the like that's the how I am. Tell me your life story. How I, have yeah. you been that's rejected? That's how I am. I no, can't help I it. it. <laughs> um, well, it's funny because we were talking about sports before we started rolling. Uh-huh. And I think what comes to mind first is um, in my junior year of high school, when things start to get rolling for, I want to play sports in college. That is my dream. Yeah. Now we're taking strides towards that. Recruiting starts to pick up. The NCAA has rules and regulations on that. But junior year is when it really starts to ramp up. Mm. And um, week three of my junior season of football I wound up breaking my femur Mm. so at that point my like football dreams to play d1 and you know all of those things recruitment stopped from a couple schools and it was just in that moment I felt rejected Mm -hmm. specifically around something that I couldn't control like a freak injury like that um and it it I felt like it really tormented me for a while in my athletics career but then senior year came around and really started to like get some more traction and you know the lord was kind to me and i was able to play at the next level um by his faithfulness and but that moment of feeling like truly rejected by schools but also like my body was rejecting me too it was odd it was it was painful physically Mm -hmm. and emotionally yeah well mine was more with school because i i uh I struggled in school when I was younger, all the way up probably through middle school, Mm -hmm. and always felt like I wasn't, I never stood out, I wasn't the smartest one in the group, and it took me a while to really get information, and I'm not sure if it was because I was a hyperactive kid, you know, I was always full of life, uh, and so um, I always felt 
kind of like I wasn't in that group that was considered to be smart sure. or the ones that were at top of the class. So I always felt that sense of rejection and became, I guess, the class clown, mm. the one who mm. drew attention, the one who tried to get everybody riled up in class, you know, uh, right. that kind of became my thing because I felt, you know, I'm not, I'm not smart enough. I'm not like everybody else. Right. Um, so that, that was kind of my thing when I was younger, that sense of rejection. Yeah. 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 I was thinking back to a long time ago. Um, it's probably one of the points when I first felt rejected and it was in friendship. Mm. Um, when we were, when I grew up overseas, um, we had to be, we didn't have TVs and, you know, we spent all of our time outside or at a friend's house. We lived in a community of, I don't know, a couple hundred families. And so, um, we spent all of our time with these people. And, um, there was one friend in my class that, she was the place, I mean, her house was the place to be. She had all of the Barbies and the whole Barbie set up, and that's what we spent our time doing, but she was only allowed to have one, maybe two friends over max. Oh. And there were probably, what, eight, ten maybe girls in our class or in right. our age group. And so she had the upper hand, and she would select who she was mm. going to have over at her house to come play Barbies with her that day. And so that was probably the first sting of re rejection that I, oh, yeah. I had, at least that I can remember, was not being the one that was chosen to yeah. go play Barbies with her at her house. So, yeah. Man, this podcast is starting pretty sad. <laughs> we got to bring some I know, life to this thing. But the point is, is that yes. we all feel and yeah. experience rejection right. and it might look different. You know, right. it might be opportunities or Yep. job opportunities that we were not given or yep. there was pen potential that we saw in our or thought we saw in ourselves that other people didn't see so we weren't right. given that opportunity it yep. can be in friendships it can be in um rejection from a family member or a spouse even there could yeah. be a lot of forms of re rejection that we face so i think that this sermon on rejection yeah. resonated with everybody because right. we all experience everybody faces it, it. And it affects our relationships moving forward. Of yep. course. And so um, I think that's where you you address that and how we don't, if we're talking about the union, the relationships that we have, then we've got to take the rejection that we've experienced it and not allow it to affect our relationships yep. or to remove ourselves from relationships or guard ourselves so that we're no longer engaging yeah. in relationships. Again, a lot of what we've been discussing the last two weeks has to do more about who we are before mm -hmm. we can really dive in how we relate to one another. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll be turning the corner a little bit this week with it, but uh, yeah, it's a good place to start. Right. Yeah, yeah so your four, first point was um, the offense. Mm -hmm. And um, you talked about how we live in a society that just – is offended <laughs> and um, that we're constantly looking for a fight. And I don't know, that resonates with me because I, I typically, um, I shy away from difficult things or conversations because I don't want somebody to be offended by something that I do or right. say, I'm not going to post anything on social media that's going to cause any controversy because I don't want I don't want to, I don't want to fight that fight. I don't, I'm not looking for a fight in any means. And so, um, yeah, you talked about that and how, when we focus on the offense, um, then we're turning on, on one another yeah. rather than facing the real enemy. And we see with David that he, his brother, he goes out to the field to serve them, to bring food and his brother, you know, David's feeling confident about Goliath and about the fight and why isn't anybody going out there and going to fight him? And Eliab, his bro older, oldest brother is like, what are, you're just a boy. What are you right. doing out here? You know, kind of, you know, go back to the fields and, um, yeah. he rejected him, but rather than David becoming offended by what his brother said or the way that he rejected him, he turned the other way. Right. And, um, so, how difficult is it for you to remember the real enemy when you become offended or when you're offended? That's a great question. Uh, well, it's hard to see um, 
because, uh, you know, a lot of times we live in the physical, not the spiritual. Yeah. And we sense things physically. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when we hear voices in our head about, when I shouldn't say hear voices, but (laughs) when we feel emotions or we sense these lines we're being told about the situations that get us in our feels or get us in our emotions, Mm. uh, a lot of times we don't understand that sometimes the enemy sounds a whole lot like ourselves. Mm. (laughs) You know what I mean? But the enemy will feed us lies, um, false narratives about a situation Right. Um, to filter it through certain aspects of our life mm-hmm. uh, that make us be become even more offended. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's it's hard to really see the enemy in it. I mean, that's not our natural instinct. It's not our natural feeling. Um, we are drawn into getting in our emotions. You know, uh, we all do it. Right. Uh, we all do it. Yeah. And so it's hard. It's very, very difficult to sense uh, what's happening. Um, there's got to be a lot of self-awareness involved. We've talked about self-awareness before. Um, we, uh, we also have to be conscious of the way we react right away. There's not enough time to process that comes with self-awareness, pulling back from the situation and saying, okay, am I seeing this right? You know, am I, why am I really upset about what's happening here? We even have a rule around here. I know it's hard to believe or not that, you know, it's hard to believe, but you know, we even as a church staff have our own stuff. You right. know, we have times where we, where we, uh, where something is said or done that uh, we have to kind of step. We got a rule around here that says you got to give it twenty four hours. Right. You know, you can be in your fields for a while, but then after twenty four hours, you got to come back and you got to begin to deal with. It. And it's purposeful for twenty four hours because you feel differently about a situation twenty four hours removed. It gives you time to think and process. Am I seeing this right? Am I, am I being, am I just being in my fields? Am I just being in my, am I really, is this really amount? Am I willing to, you know, do I need to go address it? Do I not? Right. Gives you time to process, um, a situation and really look at all aspects of it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times we fly off the handle Mm -hmm. right away with something, um, based off of a narrative we hear inside of our head, um, that we either feed to us or the enemy is feeding to us. Mm -hmm that can really destroy relationships. Right. And I feel a lot of in, uh, relationships are ruined because of things that are said too quickly. Mm-hmm. Right. Rather than processed more. Right. In the long run. Does that make sense? Yeah, Absolutely. that makes sense. Yeah. And I think it's so unique how the enemy tries to, I hear this all the time, but what the enemy can't destroy, he absolutely divides. Yeah. And he, makes this narrative like you were talking about pastor mark in our mind that it's the people that are the problem Mm -hmm. and rather than it's him that's the problem Mm -hmm. and so we find ourselves with a very narrow-minded perspective Mm -hmm. on what the actual you know issue is Mm -hmm. i think um finding ourselves in a kingdom perspective more more and more is how we'll find ourselves fighting the right fights Mm -hmm and finding ourselves in much more unity and it's just it's really difficult to see it unfold where people just constantly are fighting themselves because the enemy is just trying to maneuver around you know what the actual issue is which is the enemy himself and i think the the best way that we can attack this problem is simply reminding our security reminding ourselves of our security Mm -hmm in who God has called us to be and the fight that he has called us to fight. Right. Because that itself is such a, truthfully, it's an honor to fight on behalf of people against the enemy who mm-hmm. controls the air right. and who puts out a, a, a defensive front through, you know, just acts that are not of God and issues that are not of God. And once we find ourselves in a kingdom perspective, as much as we possibly can by fixing our heart on him, Mm -hmm. then we can truly fight the right fight and stop making this a people versus people thing. Right. But it should be a people versus the enemy type of thing. Right. And I don't know if that makes any sense, but absolutely. Yeah, it absolutely does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking, I don't know. I, for me personally, I don't typically want to engage in the fight at yeah, all right. or the, oh gosh. Um, I think about David and in that moment, I think I would have, 
I would have just gone back to the to the fields. Yeah. I wouldn't. And I think if he would have, rather than turning away from his brother, realizing there was a bigger issue, a bigger enemy, a bigger fight, um, you know, if he had listened to his oldest brother, he would have just gone back to the fields and that situation would have been yeah. different. And yeah. I just, I, I it re- that resonates with me personally because I'm not, I, I, I'm more likely just to fall into, okay, that's how they feel. And so I'm going to retreat. Sure. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of people, I say that to say that, that that's, I'm a work in progress and that there's probably a lot of people that feel that way yeah. by what something or somebody says about you, you you can be quick to believe that yeah. that's true. Absolutely. And that's where um, I've had to make sure I'm, I'm surrounding myself with people that can speak well, <laughs> into who I am, you know, and who God has called me to be. Well, to. that's exactly what I was going to say next. Part of turning away is um, you have to discern the difference in people. Right. Um, if you're constantly offended by some, then you need to protect your peace more than anything else. Yeah. yeah. You have to understand what kind of people you're around. Let's be honest. The reason why you're offended all the time by certain people is because there are certain people who love drama. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because of their own issues, they're constantly in the middle of mm-hmm. something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's you—you you know what I'm talking yes. about. Those kind of people. Yes. It's always something. There's <clears throat> yeah. always drama. Right. There's always they always got the no on everybody or everything, and they want to tell everybody what to do. Well, no wonder you're offended by them. You have got to create a distance, mm-hmm. discern yeah. these people, create turn the other way. Right. I love you, but. I got to create distance and be around the right people who are going to give you a sense of peace in your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that would save people a lot of mental energy Mm -hmm. and a protection over their own heart and soul. If they would just simply see the people who they they're given their time over to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that would save them a lot if they would do that. And I think it's so difficult though as well because oftentimes those people are people that we love dearly and that Mm -hmm. we almost have such a difficult time setting those boundaries because it's like again we don't want to offend them by setting boundaries Mm -hmm. and so you know i don't know if i can go off script and ask this to you pastor mark go off script man (laughs) hey like and to you as well sarah like Uh what does that look like to put healthy boundaries around those people that you keep around you in a way that is Christ-like because we can do it the right way and the wrong way. Mm. You can do it with a like a condemning finger pointed at somebody like, you're doing this wrong, so therefore you can't be in my life or blah, 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 blah. Right. But there's a very healthy way, I think, that we can do this. And like you said, protecting our peace in that. What does that look like for you guys? I mean, f- for me, it's, well, bo- the very word you said, boundaries or guardrails, the, the way you guard rail from me is you guard your information. Mm-hmm. You have to be very purposeful in what you say with people, particularly yeah. the ones who are um, easily offended or offend you or you know that are not the right people, e- e- regardless of what their title is in your life. Sure. Right. You know, whether they're a close yeah. family member yeah. or um, a family friend or a coworker who you can't get out of just pushing them aside or or not exactly. pushing them aside. Right. But you know what yeah. I mean about you yeah. just have to guard your information. Right. You have to guard how much you say and when you say it. Mm-hmm. Um all of those things are are guardrails and boundaries to say I have to make sure that if I have to be in relationship with you, I have to protect my information, meaning I'm not, I, I got to be careful yeah. how much I give away, right. how much I keep to myself, the way I do things, the way I say things. Or even the way that you're receiving that information from them. Yep. Yep. Um, yes. When you're in conversation too, to yep. you kind of have to prepare how you're going to perceive or receive yeah. that right. information from them. Once yeah. again, that's self-awareness yeah. of filters and perception yeah. and how do I want to view this? And I know I know how they are. So sure. I can't take every every comment to heart. Right. Yeah. And be a complete critic of it. That right. what does that mean? Or what are they trying to say? Why would they say that to me? You know what I mean? Yeah, right. you, ha- you have to be very careful with that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. 
And it's even just, you know, guarding your mind and not allowing your mind to take it in a yep. whole I mean, way out of right. out of context as well. Because right. like you can't always put a physical boundary on Absolutely. some of these relationships right. either, right. because there's people that are just going to be in your in your life, yeah. um, no matter what. So Absolutely. those boundaries sometimes look a little bit different. Yep. Well, you moved into the, the fit, your second point, which I love. This is one of my favorite parts of this passage of scripture um, where Saul tries to put or puts David into his armor um, and how I loved how you took, took that and talked about how a lot of times we are trying to people please or put on um, the expectations and wear other people's um, fit. Yeah. Um, and I just thought that was, I didn't even know you were going to go that direction. I'm very really? impressed with your creativity with this. Okay, so um, props to you. <laughs> um, but just putting on the expectations of others, appearances, you know, uh, to be liked and approved by someone else. I think we all do this in different seasons of our lives where we so desperately want to be accepted that we end up putting on the wrong wrong outfit, the wrong clothes. So what is, what does that look like for you in your lives? Yeah, I think, um, you can look at it from two, two perspectives. Um, number one for me personally, as, as a leader, mm -hmm. I think is a very vulnerable place to be in. Mm -hmm. And for those that are listening or watching, you are a leader in your sphere, Yeah, you know, wherever you find yourself, whether it's in like nobody is exempt from leadership in one way or another, whether it's in your friendships, relationships, workspace, all of the things. Um, but it's very, it's a very vulnerable place to find yourself in yeah. wanting to not just meet the needs of the people that you're leading, mm -hmm. but do it in a sense that, you know, they want to keep coming back and being led by you. Right. And I talked about this uh, last week, but the level of insecurity that I felt I had to really deal with in order to lead more effectively mm -hmm. that came from a place of people pleasing mm -hmm. and wanting to be and perfectionism and yeah. saying if I slip up then it's over for me like mm -hmm. I just you know I didn't execute this well so why am I worthy of being followed or you know fill in the blank there um, but I think that when we humble ourselves mm -hmm. and realize that especially as leaders in the church world um, Matthew 16 18 says that Jesus Jesus says, I will build my church mm -hmm. and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So ultimately what we are, are not, not even the, we're not the focal point mm -hmm. of Jesus building his church. Right. It's Jesus who's the focal point of building his church. Right. We get to be, be a, a part, part of, of that. Right. And humbling myself in that way has helped tremendously in not trying to put on this, this, this armor that I felt like of, I have to do everything the right way or else the church isn't going to be built. Yeah. Um, or, you know, people aren't going to get saved. People mm -hmm. aren't going to get baptized. All of these things. It's like Jesus said himself that I'm going to build my church. Yeah. And even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So that's like a weight lifted mm -hmm. off of my shoulders of I can operate in the way that God has gifted me for right. and called me to right. with a slingshot and a few smooth rocks. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I feel like for any, any leader that's listening to this. Mm -hmm. It's like, no matter what sphere you're in, it's Jesus that's going to do what he has already set out to do. Right. And we just get to be a part of it. Yeah. So take off that mm -hmm. thing that doesn't fit anymore. And then looking you can at lead it from, more free. Exactly. <laughs> and looking at it, even just from a smaller perspective yeah. outside of leadership mm -hmm. as a Christian in today's world is like the biggest desire is to go against what the public perception of Christianity is nowadays mm -hmm. of, you know, I, I won't harp on this, but there's a lot of people that are almost afraid to be public with their faith because of how mm -hmm. it's been painted, mm -hmm. because of how the church has been painted yeah. and how, you know, people perceive the the polarization between a Christian lifestyle and a worldly lifestyle and how people are like, again, it's, it, this is what we're talking about mm -hmm. in this sermon series is two people pitted against each other. Right. And so I, I think that there's so many people that put on put on this suit of compromise in their faith that doesn't fit them either 
of I don't want to be outspoken about my faith and what I believe and what I see in people, what I'm believing for this world, because yeah. I don't want to come off as offensive or I don't want to come off mm -hmm. as polarizing in some way or some fashion. Right. But how great is it that ultimately the truth will be the truth no matter how you cut it. Right. But we have a mandate on our lives, and the only thing that we need to put on that does fit is putting on love. That is how we are meant to bring the gospel to people and bring the truth to people is yeah. the truth lathered in love. Right. And so taking off compromise, but also taking off that fear of, you know, offending people by just mm -hmm. how well are you loving people? Yeah. That's how you'll be able to be outspoken with your faith. Yeah. You know, there's just so much that I feel like we put on that I think today's the day for people to take it off. If yeah. it wasn't on Sunday, right. today's the day. I think people are looking for a difference from us. We we compromise. We want to please people. But ultimately, what we have is what people long for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And we can't be afraid to not fit in. The Bible says we are a peculiar people. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're just, we're, we're different. We're, we're because strangers. We're aliens to we're this. We're strangers. Yeah. We're aliens. I mean, you could go on and on. Right from a scriptural standpoint mm -hmm. of what the Bible says that we are now as believers. And so um, we don't have to live with that expectation of what we, you know, we could just be who God has called us to be right. and the world will see there's something different. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's how we make a difference in people's lives. Right. The expectations of people, uh, I know from my personal perspective, there had to get a point in my leadership, particularly as a pastor that I used to be when I was much younger, had much darker hair <laughs> back then uh, to try to people please, to, to live up to the expectations of what people placed on me. Yeah. Right. But the older, longer I've done this, the longer I've done it, the older I get and the more kids I had. Amen. Uh, just <laughs> the more maturity I got, I was yeah. like, man, you're gonna, if you're living to please people, guess what? It'll, it'll never come to an end. No. There will be pressures to live up to an expectation, uh, yeah. and you're not going to be able to please everybody. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get to everybody. You're Somebody's not going to be gonna... everybody's cup of tea either. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, I, I have learned I cannot be, and for my own self, that this is my own personal yeah. experience, and I'm a pastor, so this is yeah. my own personal experience. I cannot be everyone's Holy Spirit. Yeah. I can't save people. Right. Yeah. I can't, you know, and, and people have to look at a pastor that way too. Mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. that when there is a crucial moment and in their life, um, I have to pray with pastor. No, you can pray by yourself and get the same Holy spirit. There ain't yeah. nothing in me that's different than what you have. You have right. everything you need. Right. Yeah. Um, so I had to come to terms with that. And I think people need to do that in their own life, whatever mm -hmm. that expectation is of people mm -hmm. that's been placed on them. Right. I'm a pastor. Maybe it's being a parent. Maybe it's be oh I got I got to have for my kids I've got to have this this is the expectation right. mm -hmm. this is what they've got to wear and this is what they got to have and this is what they got to do no 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 this no this is no, the no. way it needs to look this is yeah. the way it needs to look no 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 don't try to keep up with the Joneses yeah. yeah don't try to live the expectations that social media puts on you you don't try to fit in that way mm -hmm. you seek God for your way of parenting and what he has called you to do right you instill in them kids the right things mm -hmm. and uh and God will take care of of the rest yeah. I mean the yeah. list goes on and on we can apply it to every single person yes you know, of, of the where they're at you don't have to fit in be who God called you to be right Amen. and that's the beauty of of David um and how he wasn't comfortable, nor did he want to wear yeah. Saul's armor um, for the fight that he had. He he knew who he already was right. uh, in Christ. And I think that's the beauty of his story too, that, you know, he was anointed to be the next king, but then he was sent back to the fields to tend to the sheep. And to, I mean, to just our natural instinct, it's like, well, what God, you would call somebody, but then you would send them back to what they were doing before but that's where we are formed. That's where we are created into who he want, wants us to be, are in right. those places where our life really is more so hidden in him, where he can develop us and prepare us for yeah. what he's called us to do, where it's just us and God, you know? Yeah. It's just me and him. 
And that's where we really find our true identity. And um, maybe somebody can be encouraged by that today, too, is that, you know, if you just take a break from all the places that you're trying to find that acceptance and take a step back and really seek God on that and find your true identity in him, he'll develop that where you're no longer trying to put on somebody else's armor yeah. for the fight that that you're going to face um, ahead. You'll be much more prepared for to fight with what God's given you. Yeah. And he's given you all you need. Yeah. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about being children of the Lord. Well, your last point was the fight. And um, I didn't even get to listen to the last this last part of your message. Wah, so wah, you're going wah. to have, <laughs> you're gonna have to... Um, yeah, is there anything about your last point that you would want to kind of wrap our discussion to? I was just talking about marker moments. You know, the fight was really, that was that marker moment for mm. David. Yeah. That was the set-apart moment for David. Yeah. And God is always directing us to those to those moments, whatever that may, may be, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and David just served people, I mean, in what he was called to do, like, Hey, go take the bread. Well, I just took the bread, and he just took the bread to the battlefield, and that turned into all this rejection, yes, but it led him to the direct, it was the direction that led him to that marker moment, or yeah. just walking in his purpose of what God created him for. Yeah. And the point of that is like, hey, you just serve people where you're at. Yes, you're going to be mm-hmm. rejected. Mm-hmm. Yes, you're going to be turned away. That's part of relationships and people. It, you know, um, But if you keep serving people, you're really serving per- your purpose. Yeah. And he is positioning you for the marker moments, mm. the things that really set you apart of who God created you to be. And when you serve people, you're serving purpose, and then God will bring the right people. Right. There's people for you. Don't give up hope. Don't mm. give up on people. Don't give up on relationships. Yeah. Just because you've been hurt. Right. You got to keep returning back to it, and God will direct these people for your life. Um, that are going to come alongside of you, that are going to encourage you, that are going to help you, that are going to believe God for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so don't give up, don't give up hope on that. Yeah, that's good. Is there anything you would add, Angel? No, I think you're absolutely right, mm-hmm. and I think it's it's really beautiful when you do have those people that are your armor bearers. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I even think of of Moses and just how there's there's specific people that had to come alongside of even him um, to carry out the incredibly specific call that God had on his life. You can go through the entire Bible and see so many times that it wasn't people that were doing it alone. And um, there are those people, you're so right, that once they come alongside, those those are the ones that will lift up your arms when your arms become heavy and can no longer have them up. It's, it's really special. And I'm grateful to have those people in my life currently. And I'm excited for who those people would be 20 years from now. Right. Yeah. You know, it's really cool. Yeah. Really good. All right. Pastor Mark, will you close us in prayer? I will. Okay. Well, Father, we thank you for this time today. And I specifically pray for people who feel a sense of rejection today, God. And, uh, some people have really been just burdened by this. Um, They've sensed it at an early age in their life, and they've been carrying it for many years. Lord, I pray that this message would really reveal that they don't have to stay in a sense of rejection. They can return back to relationships, Lord. They would release the rejection to you, know who they are in you, and keep walking in purpose, keep serving you because you can bring a sense of healing inside of their hearts and bring healthy relationships now into their life. Father, I pray that we continue to work on ourselves because it's key to work on our, it's key in having right relationships comes from being right within ourselves. Fresh filters, fresh perspectives that then push us forward in healthy relationships. Thank you, God, 
that we are a church who is taking time to really make sure we are where we need to be healthy mentally, spiritually, God, to have the best relationships we can, and particularly in this season in our life, God, we pray. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.